Biden did something to our discourse. The, the liabilities of having people uh, be certain of paradise uh, became exquisitely obvious to many of us. Uh, and then the Bush administration uh, and the, the, the fact that we have a president who begins every day on his knees in prayer and has Bible study, I think, has made many people uncomfortable. So that, I think, is the um, certainly motivates a, a lot of readers. But I think it's easy to, to draw the wrong message from the fact that there are multiple new, so-called new atheist bestsellers. Because between me and Dawkins and Hitchens and Dennett, I think we've sold something like three million books. Uh, but, of course, many people have bought all the books, so it's, there's not three million readers there. There's maybe a million readers, and someone like Rick Warren sells a million books a month, and that's just one pastor. So it's, it's still a very small uh, segment of the, of the, the book-buying population, and uh, as we all know, uh, not so many people buy certainly hardcover books. So, What do you think? Well, I, there's no doubt that... It's, that uh, the, what is the Islamic threat, essentially, um, is uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, but which I would say is a, a particular brand of, of Islam, which is right now a virulent strain, is something that has indicted all religion in some people's eyes. And I would say also that science and the place of science, which is at the heart of, in particular, Dawkins and Dennett's book, um, is part of what people debate about and I think don't understand very well. What, what do you think they don't get? They don't get that science is powerful, but it's narrow. And the idea that science explains human life is an idea that I think is promoted only by um, people who are under the misimpression that the place of science in human life is a scientific question when in fact it's a philosophical or religious question. And you can't explain the place of science in human life in scientific terms, just like you can't explain what an idea is in scientific terms. It's intangible and philosophical and religious. And I think that a lot of people are, or at least a number of people who are educated scientifically but not philosophically or theologically think that now that science is as powerful and as potent as it is, there's no place for religion, or it has, in some sense, disproved religion. What do you think of that, Mr. Yeah, that's a very good place to start. Um, well, I think the one thing to notice is that the dialogue between science and religion has gone this way. It has been one of relentless and one-directional erosion of religious authority. I, I would challenge anyone here to think of a question upon which we once had a scientific answer, however inadequate, but for which now the best answer is a religious one. Now you can think of an uncountable number of questions that run the other way, where, where we once had a religious answer, uh, and now the authority of religion has been battered and nullified uh, by science and by moral progress and secular progress generally. Um, and I think that's not an accident. Uh, and the, the one area where religion still seems to uh, hold its ground uh, is now under assault by science, and it's, it's very good that it is under assault by science. And this is the whole issue of morality and human happiness and what constitutes the good life. Uh, these are, and let me just tell you why I, I think this is a scientific question. Even the place of science is ultimately a scientific question. Um, because surely there are objective facts to be learned about the basis of human happiness. The, the moment you recognize that morality and spirituality and, and, and value is a matter of, of happiness and suffering, and that we're moving suffering uh, in the direction of happiness, uh, then you, you realize that if there are objective facts to know about human happiness, and surely there are uh, facts about the way that genes and ideas and uses of attention and economic systems, uh, social structures, all of these conspire to make us happy or miserable. Uh, and uh, again, the, 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 it's true that, that scientific discourse is just in the beginning of addressing these issues. Uh, but it, it's not too soon to say that love is better than hate. 
in terms of ethics. And we are, we are studying these things at the level of the brain. Eventually, we will understand the brain basis of love and hate and the kinds of, of, of mechanisms, both cultural and, and personal, that uh, ramify these states of mind. Uh, and there will be right and wrong answers. And we'll find, for instance, that honor killing is a bad strategy if you want to raise compassionate men. Uh, we know that already, but we'll, uh, at some point we will know this biochemically. Um, so that, what do you think of that? I, I, well, first of all, I, boy, I can think of a couple of uh, examples, although I don't think that that's crucial, but for example, Marxism, which was the scientific study of societies and was thought of as a science. But nobody as thinks that's science. Nobody thinks it is now. You said an answer now that uh, people once thought was scientific but no longer do. That's a good example. Oh, no, no, uh, but religious that, answer, a just, religious let me answer. Let clarify my question. But now. a religious answer to life is much better now than this, than this poor science that was Marxism, or for that matter, I would say, than the not, not very good science that was Freudianism. But go ahead. Oh, well, I, I agree on both counts. It's just that the point to make is that the, the antidote to bad science or failed science or scientific incompleteness is good science and more science. It's not religion. I, I by the way, I'm, I want to preempt that answer for religion. That's exactly the answer to bad religion or poor religion or failed religion mm -hmm. is more religion instead of saying that religion ought to be banished because, for example, people think mistakenly that good religion is flying planes into buildings. Um, but but I, I, I also think that the, the way that you set it up at the beginning is not the way that it used to be or that it has to be. Hmm. That is, science and religion weren't classically in opposition, except in certain specific instances. And even those instances are much more complicated than we su suspect. You know, Galileo and, Pope, and the Pope, Pope Urban, were friends. And there is a friendship issue as well as a lot of political issues that were involved in Galileo's eventual recantation. It wasn't just there was faith over here and there was Galileo over there, when in fact there were people in the church who agreed with Galileo. And Newton was a devout Christian, as you may know. And the relation between science and religion wasn't classically just oppositional. It was sometimes oppositional, but more often synergistic. And people believed that they coexisted, as they should. Um, but, but you can't answer the question of what's a good life scientifically. You can't. Not, I, can say, I can say what will make you feel a certain way. But whether that's good, I'm, let me give you an example. You talked about happiness. Mm -hmm. There are some people who've lived very unhappy lives that religiously you would evaluate as very good lives. I mean, Rabbi Akiva at the end of his life was not happy. <laughs> right? I mean, he was, he was martyred. But if you were to bring Rabbi Akiva back to life and say, would you say that the end of your life was good or bad, he would say, I have no doubt, painful but good. And if you said to him, but what about scientifically? He would say, well, scientifically I was being burned alive. But you can't evaluate the, my life scientifically. And in fact, I just want to give one little sermonic coda here. <laughs> Anybody, just one. Just one. Yeah. just one for the moment. Okay. <laughs> How could you know me so quickly? I um, so, <laughs> Um, anybody who has children or who believes that they're doing something important in this world or who works in difficult circumstances to bring water to villages or food to hungry people would say that the idea that you could scientifically demonstrate a good life is worse than empty. It's a mockery. Okay. Well, that, that, that's good. I, I see that the term happiness is a little too effete to capture what I'm after here. I, I'm talking about well-being. I'm talking about all of the factors that we recognize that, that correspond to the good life. And, and I'm certainly uh, open to the possibility that we have yet to fully characterize the good life religiously, philosophically, and certainly scientifically. I mean, this is an open conversation. The question is, do you ever have to believe anything on insufficient evidence to explore this terrain, to become truly... Uh, and what is sufficient evidence? Well, it's, it's the kind of evidence everyone in this room demands on any subject other than religion. I mean, there, there are nuances here. We can, we, it, it takes a lot of work to 
to rise to the standard of scientific evidence. But um, science is the one language game we are playing where we get really straight and rigorous about what constitutes evidence, where there's a process of peer review, uh, where you have a lot of smart people trying to prove you wrong, and where you actually win points by proving yourself wrong. And this is not what religions are up to. Religions are not uh, falsifiable in this way. And I think you used a phrase that I, I thought was very um, useful to frame this. You, you talked about what uh, used to be and what must be, I think was your phrase. And I think we should reflect on what used to be, because our religions come to us out of a tradition, in many cases, of, of, of human sacrifice. I mean, this, a human sacrifice was a, virtually a cultural universal. This is where we come from. These are the roots of religion. This is, it has been not... It's been by no means rare for a child to be born into this world only to find that he is being raised by religious maniacs who think that the best way to keep the sun on its course or to cure the king's venereal disease is to bury or butcher or burn him alive as an offering to an imaginary god. This is, this has, this is not just the Aztecs. Uh, this is the ancient Hebrews. Uh, human sacrifice is in the, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, at times condemned, at times tacitly supported, at times demanded, and then, as you know in the story of Abraham, uh, uh, the demand is, is recanted. Um, this is, we, we come from tradition, from generations of people who did, who did not know a damn thing about the causes of events in the world that really concern them, the spread of disease, the, the failure of crops, the weather. Um, and so, Religious discourse has changed. We're not sacrificing people uh, happily now, but it has changed by virtue of progress from the outside. I mean, certain, certain modes of operation are no longer tenable. When you can get a weather report on the evening news, you no longer have to sacrifice a child in a vain attempt to control the weather. So, yeah, I did have a question. I want to go back to what you said at the very beginning, that religion is the one thing that we believe on insufficient evidence. Um, and I want to ask you, and I, I'm only asking this a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but on what evidence do you believe that life is worth living? Well, I just think that's a, a misconstrual of how we talk about beliefs. I mean, you're not, this is, this is something I get in another form quite often. I wrote this book entitled The End of Faith, and people attack me um, essentially with the line, but you need faith to get out of bed in the morning. You know, we, our lives are built on faith. That's not the kind of faith I'm attacking. I'm, t I'm talking about... Oh, but, you, but you said explicitly that religion is the only thing that we believe things on insufficient evidence. Well, so it, I'm it, asking you if you yeah. believe that life is good or worthwhile on the basis of scientific evidence. Because if you don't, then I would amend your statement to religion and everything else that is of central value in our lives, we believe on evidence that is not susceptible to scientific proof. That right. I'll go no. with. I think, I think you're equivocating on the, the, the meaning of the word believe. But we don't, I don't believe that life is worth living. That's not what gets me through my day. I am operating as though life is worth living because I am, I am, I am seeking various states of, of happiness. I'm avoiding suffering. I'm moved by compassion. I have these states in me which presuppose the reasonableness of not killing myself at the end of the day. Is which is not so different, by the way, yeah. from a religious person who would say, this is the, you know, religion is not belief in a proposition. It's an orientation towards life. I live in the presence of God. That's how I feel. It's not that I, someone says to me, okay, here's all the evidence from column A and here's the evidence from column B. Now, which one do you decide on? That's not how you decide whether you believe or not in God. Belief in this sense is not a great word. I believe it the same way you believe that life is worth living. And you would never say, as long as somebody can prove to me that uh, I, I don't believe life is worth living scientifically, I may as well give up. So you're, you're, it's a disconnect. It's like saying, you know, um, I don't know, it's like, it's a category mistake. It's like saying of, you know, that wall, how, um, how jealous is it? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, no, you don't no, evaluate a religious I, I belief I scientifically. Share, I, I think I need to share a comment that he wrote in The End of Faith. Okay. And I'd be curious to have you expand oh. upon it, where you uh, wrote, 
there is clearly a sacred dimension to our existence, and coming to terms with it could well be the highest purpose of human life. Sounds very spiritual to me. Yeah, I, I am. I part company with many atheists in that I'm interested in spiritual experience. I think there is, I, while I wish we had a better word for it, I think because that, that word we have to recognize carries a lot of metaphysical baggage, there is such a thing as profoundly transformative, meaningful experience that can be very hard won. I mean, you, can, you, you might have to go into a cave for a month or a year to have certain experiences. Um, and so the, whole, the contemplative literature is something that, that I've, I read and I take seriously. The problem is it is all so riddled with religious superstition and dogmatism uh, that you really do have to be a selective consumer of this literature. And every religious person takes his peak experiences as confirmation of the, of the metaphysics in which he is seeking those experiences. So the, the, the Muslim thinks that this is the, you know, his feelings of, of rapture during prayer, thinks, he thinks this confirms the, the fact that, that Muhammad was really in his cave talking to the Archangel Gabriel and that the Quran is the perfect word of God. And I, I mean, your, your claim that, that religion is not a matter of believing propositions it's just manifestly false when you're talking about what billions of people I didn't say religion. Believe. I said belief in God. Well, belief in God. I mean, it, it entails belief in certain propositions, but belief in God isn't a propositional belief the way I believe that this, you know, table is hard. Well, for, for you, a belief in, in um, the divine origin of certain books figures rather centrally to Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Yes. Uh, this contail, entails a variety of claims which are on their face at odds with science. Um, the belief that, that Jesus was born of a virgin may be a, a, a cherished claim for most Christians. It is also a claim about biology. I mean, this is why you can't keep religion and science apart. They are, they, 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 their truth claims cannot be disentangled, which is what you want I don't to do. Wanna, I don't want to spend my night defending the virgin birth, but... Uh, um, <laughs> But it's now actually I have my, now I have my story. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. It, it would be. But it actually is not a claim about biology. What it is a claim about is the idea that natural laws, which themselves, by the way, are an article of faith. I mean, we know since you. No, you, you can't. can't that's through. a very slippery you, and dangerous. Yes, slope, but it's but, true. I mean, you can I, They are. You don't. You can't say. I, and this is this. I didn't start this. Hume did, and no, he was no, a good no, atheist. <laughs> you'll you'll uh, notice nobody however, says this in an airplane at thirty thousand. Having feet. said that, yeah, well, it is. Yeah. I didn't say that it's not an article of firm faith, but it's still an article of faith. Um, that those laws can never be suspended is seems to me, on the face of it, a claim that's unprovable. And there's no reason why a Christian can't say that the laws of biology have been suspended once in history or will be suspended sometime in the future. That's not the same thing as a, that, that doesn't, no, that, but that is to me, to be a conflict claim, between. It is a claim yeah. about physics and cosmology. I mean, it, 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 it touches all, all of science. And so, I mean, for instance, the idea, the, this yeah. expectation on the part of something like 59% of the American population, according to Gallup, that Jesus will return to Earth to judge us. This entails claims about the human survival of death, the apparently the f human flight without the aid of technology. I mean, this is what people are visualizing. Uh, this is... Do you think, I'm curious, do you think that the idea of human survival of death is an anti-scientific claim? Well, in, in the naive form that, that most people entertain it, it clearly is. Now, I... And this is well, they don't think that, that their body doesn't disintegrate. They assume that it does disintegrate. What they assume is that there is something inside of you that is eternal, which yeah. I assume as well. And it doesn't seem, to me anti, doesn't seem to me anti-scientific. Well, it's anti-scientific if you um, believe that you have good evidence for that. I mean, this, this, is, this is what's anti-scientific. When your certainty, when your convictions don't scale with your evidence. I mean, I'm actually open-minded on the survival of death. I, I right. don't you know. You say about reincarnation, that there could even be evidence for it in your book. Yes, I mean, I, I can easily tell you what would constitute evidence. I'm not saying this evidence exists, but um, I, mean, I can tell you what would constitute evidence for the truth of Mormonism. It's, it's, it's just not forthcoming. Uh, <laughs> this isn't, we're not going to get political yeah. on this. No. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, this, uh, there, there are all kinds of scientific things you can say about 
religion, which religious people tend not to want to hear. I mean, you can say, for instance, that Mormonism is objectively less likely to be true than Christianity. Now, why can you say this? Because Mormonism is just Christianity plus some rather stupid ideas. Let me ask you seriously a question that's not... This question is actually not a gotcha at all. I'm, I really do wonder whether you believe that it is possible, since you say something about the, the viability of intuition uh -huh. in your book, I wonder if you think that it's possible for people to know things or, if you don't want to use no, to believe true things and feel like they have evidence for true things that is not accessible through reason. Or is that not possible? Yeah, well, I th this opposition between intuition and reason um, ultimately is a false one because our, our, our reasoning is intuitive to the core. I mean, if, if I ask you how you know that 2 plus 2 makes 4, you will be at pains to explain it. And, and intuition is simply that mode we're operating in where things just strike us as true or false and we can't get beneath them. Now, there are ways okay. to get beneath them scientifically. I mean, we can, we can know a lot about intuition and failures of intuition. Um, and we use certain intuitions to uh, uh, get around other intuition. I mean, just take a very simple example. If I asked you uh, um, how, if you folded a newspaper a hundred times, how thick would it be? Most people intuitively think, well, yeah, I can do that, and it's going to be you know, as, thi as thick as the Sunday Times or a brick or something. But it's actually you know, six billion light years across. Now, how you, we get there from, you know, with just the, the, the intuitions of arithmetic. I mean, you, you explain the process of, of exponentiation to somebody, how you, to fold a piece of paper a hundred times is to, is to essentially multiply its thickness by two raised to the power of a hundred, and then you see that the numbers get very big. Now, this is not, this is reasoning. This is, this is you don't get much more rigorous than, than arithmetic in terms of reasoning, but it is intuitive to the core. The, the fact that, that any of this is intelligible is, is a matter of intuition. So yes, there are ethical intuitions. There are, I would argue, contemplative or spiritual intuitions. But no intuition you can have when you sit down in prayer or in meditation is going to uh, authenticate most of what religious people believe most of the time in the service of their religions like the virgin birth of Jesus, so the divine origin. No, of I, agree. I agree, and I don't think that most religious people would say that, that's in, that that comes to them through intuition, but I wonder, since from the beginning of time, 98% of all human beings who have ever lived have had an intuitive sense that there is something, some being or force greater than themselves, does that constitute for you even a scintilla of evidence that it's true? Uh, no. No. Okay. Well, okay. So, so. Yeah. Okay. Just asking. You, you just yeah. asking. Uh, you touched on something earlier that uh, relates to a question I want to ask. Um, many writers dealing with this subject have talked about the dangers of religious fundamentalism, of extremism. Uh, you've talked about religious moderates. Right. If you could share those ideas, uh, and I know you're yeah. interested in this topic yeah. as well. Yes. So, um, um, well, an example of it, although not a particularly um, uh, egregious one, emerged in this conversation. I mean, the fact that you would say belief in God is not a matter of believing propositions. Um, that is the kind of uh, utterance one hears from religious moderates. I, mean, I don't know how you would describe yourself, but you're, you're not. I'm a uh, fanatic. You're not a fanatic. No. <laughs> um, not about this, though. About other. Uh, the, pr the problem with saying that is that it it effectively covers for, I mean, what you're, you're arguing, right. uh, this is what religion should be, essentially, and, and yet it becomes a kind of descriptive claim, this is what religion is, and so we can um, uh, slip into a mode of not acknowledging just how much mad work and how much needless human suffering uh, is being perpetuated because of Explicit right. propositions so the moderates that people make believe. it acceptable, and you don't really realize how bad things well, are. Well, one, one moderates want faith itself to be respected at all costs, and they want the basic project of raising children to be Jews or Muslims or Christians to be respected. And in that context, uh, it is often very difficult to honestly evaluate just how much needless human suffering is being produced on a daily basis by by religion and religious belief. 
So I, I, I understand what you're saying that, that you, and I've read that you indict moderates because we give cover in a way for religious fanaticism. Um, I, I would say two things, and I suspect the second will be the basis of another conversation here. The first is that it is, let's say, I, I don't know that I like the word moderates, but it is um, healthy religion that provides the only hope for Sikh religion to be well. I don't think that there is any chance that the preaching of irreligion will in fact persuade those who are fanatic to change their ways, but I think those who know how to speak the same language have some chance of doing that. The second point that I would make is that when you talk about the needless suffering that religion has caused, I think that it's time maybe to address the historical record because I think that religion's record is nothing less than exemplary compared to irreligion. And so I would say that if you're going to try in this world um, to make a, uh, a decent world that historically speaking, although I won't speak for the future, um, you are much better off training people to believe that they are not the most powerful, most knowledgeable, um, most decisively uh, able to come to conclusions about the world creation, but that in fact a certain amount of humility, both about what they know and what they do, is appropriate, and that humility comes from. But, but how yes. do you have tolerance and faith coexist? Well, it has throughout history. Tol it, oh, sure it has. Absolutely. I mean, even today, let's take the most intolerant. You know, I find this really interesting. People, the other night we had a somebody who was, um, at the very least, I would say, as extraordinarily, uh, she is a, I think she would probably call herself a, a, a reformed Muslim, no longer a Muslim. She grew up in Muslim society, is extremely harsh on Islam. Um, so I said to her, what about Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country? And she said, you know, we're very afraid of Indonesia being radicalized. And I thought to myself, if you're very afraid of Indonesia being radicalized, what does that mean about the largest Muslim country? that it has not yet been radicalized, or that there was a time before it was radicalized. And the idea that if somebody is the member of a certain faith, such as Christianity, which introduced the idea of toleration to the Western world, that therefore they can't be tolerant is clearly contradicted by much of history. Um, and it seems to me that if you want to find intolerance, you look for atheistic regimes. Would you rather live in North Korea or South Korea? Okay. South Korea is Christian. Don't North answer Korea that is communist. question. Yeah. Well, you yeah. cited many examples in your book. Uh, yeah, well, well the, the thing is, this, this is a, a trick, and this is one of the reasons why I'm... It's not a trick. I, I'm not a fan of the term atheism. I mean, the, a, atheism is a, is a term totally without content. It's like being a non-astrologer. You know? I mean, we, we don't have a word for someone who's not an astrologer. We, and, we don't, and if astrologers suddenly became ascendant in our society, we wouldn't need to invent non-astrology as a discipline. We could talk about reason and science and evidence and common sense and bullshit mm -hmm. and put astrologers in their place. And mm -hmm. I, so it could be with religion. Um, and so this, this notion that uh, Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot uh, were doing what they did because of atheism, because of non-belief in God. I mean, ask yourself, is, is too much skeptical inquiry really what's wrong with North Korea. I mean, the North Koreans are a cargo cult armed with nuclear weapons right now. They think that the food aid that we give them is a, is a devotional offering to the genius of their dear leader. They are systematically impoverished, both physically and in terms of information. They are, they, 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 too much knowledge, any knowledge is too much knowledge uh, in North Korea. This is not a, a, a paradise of reasonableness. Now, all I'm advocating is that we use the same standards of rationality that we use in every other area of our lives when people start making claims about the divine origin of certain books and the virgin birth of certain people and the glorious end to history where we're, the good people will be raptured into the sky. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we should uh, apply pressure to and it is taboo to ap apply pressure to these claims. And religious moderation, unfortunately, ramifies that taboo. OK, so first of all, it's hardly taboo. Um, I mean, you know, three million books may not be a lot. In your um, 
and your uh, litany of, uh, of bestsellers, but it's a lot of books. And I don't think that it's certainly in our society and in Europe, it's not taboo to preach atheism. More books are poured forth every day. But here's the question. I do want you to look, actually, at the historical record. Let's just take the Western monotheistic faiths, OK? Before they existed, think about the world. I forget pre -state, the pre-state world, where cultural anthropologists tell us that about one in every four men died a violent death. And then you had um, pre-monotheistic regimes like Assyria, Babylonia, which were savage beyond the imagination of anything you will find in the Bible or anywhere else. And then, all of a sudden, when it became possible for there to be a regime without a religion, and you know when that became possible, right? That became possible in the French Revolution. That was when it first became possible to not have a religion. Now, is it just an extraordinary coincidence that genocide started to enter the modern world, first with the bloodbath that followed the French Revolution, then with the Napoleonic Wars, that the worst war that ever happened in this country, the Civil War, was not a religious war, that when you had regimes, whatever you want to call them, that explicitly rejected religion, you had Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, I mean, I could go on and on and on. It just seems to me an extraordinary coincidence, far beyond the possibility of believing, to say that, no, what was wrong with all these regimes is that they didn't think like Sam Harris. Because it's true, they didn't think like Sam Harris. But the values that you take with skeptical inquiry are values that, in fact, were taken from the religious regimes that you find unpalatable and no, that were rejected no, no. by all these regimes that were genocidal, well, including, well, of course, the worst from the point of view of, uh, of any single country, which was Hitler, Mao, and Stalin. Okay, there are a few claims there that we have to shelve. One, one is this idea that we get, you just claim that I bet, got my morality from a religious tradition. Mm. Um, ask yourself, when you pick up the Bible or the Hebrew Bible um, or any holy book uh, and find ethical wisdom in there, well, how, what is that process like? I mean, you pick up uh, Leviticus or Deuteronomy and you find that if a woman is not a virgin on her wedding night, you're supposed to stone her to death on her father's doorstep. Okay, presumably you choose to reject that pearl of ancient wisdom. Uh, and then you find another line, you know, I think this is also in Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, uh, or the golden rule, as preached in the New Testament. Uh, and this resonates with you as a, as a, as a good um, operating premise to generate further moral intuitions. Uh, if nothing else, it's a good ideal to live toward. Uh, now, that process, you, the guarantor of your morality in that case is not the book. It's in your brain. Uh, and th this kind of truth testing is something that we bring to religion. Now, religion does a lot of work on people, and you can get good people to believe some very terrible things uh, in the name of God. And this is what worries me about religion and uh, to, I, you know, I think we should we waste time talking about Stalin and Hitler and, and Pol Pot frankly because these were these were political religions these were dogmatisms through and through and when anyone started to make too much sense in opposition to these dogmatisms they were carted off and killed uh, these were not these, these were not contexts in which rational discourse prevailed and the best idea won uh, so to call them science is just to misuse the term. Uh, and, and it's, I mean, in the case of Hitler, it's just a, a total non sequitur because Hitler never really repudiated Jesus and he used Jesus in his speech and he's, you know, he was facilitated by a thousand years of religious fulminating against the Jews in the name of Christianity. I mean, this is, uh, religion is implicated certainly in the Holocaust. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not, I think, a conversation worth having. I'm sorry, I brought a quote. Okay. This is from Viktor Frankl, who is a survivor and a therapist. This book, The Doctor and the Soul. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of a theory that man is nothing but the product of, hereditary, of heredity and environment, or as the Nazis like to say, of blood and soil. I'm absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Maidanek were ultimately prepared 
not in some ministry or other in Berlin, but rather at the desks and in lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. Okay, well that, that is a, an opinion that I think we can all reject on its face. Really? <laughs> Cle clearly. This, 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 do you really think you you think Auschwitz yes, is the result I, absolutely. of thinking I think too that the rejection, the yes, world. the rejection of transcendence and the idea that human beings are all heredity and environment and breeding and eugenics and social Darwinism was absolutely a much greater contributor than the the all um, the, than the rejected, hatred of Jews than the rejected Christianity. Well, it wasn't just it wasn't just the destruction of the Jewish people. It was don't forget World War II, right? This was much wider than the hatred of one people. But yes, why, why, why was it focused on the Jews? In part because the explanation that Hitler gave wasn't theological. The explanation that he gave was racial. That's had, it, had it been theological, I would say yes, theological. But strikingly, but weren't the all these... Theological, these uh, the history no, of there was, there was a long history of anti-Semitism, but why did it never explode into genocide in a Christian, well, in a Christian government? It, it, it was, first of all, it, the, the, the history of the Jews in Europe is a history punctuated by, rather ceaselessly by no pogroms questions. and murder that was explicitly religious. I mean, you have something like host desecration. Yes. I don't know if you know about this phenomenon that um, I came across while researching my first book. The, the, the communion host is thought to be once blessed, is thought to actually physically be the body of Jesus. And therefore, uh, if it's mistreated, this is, you know, you, you can literally, in torturing a cracker, you are torturing the body of Jesus. Uh, there are accounts of whole villages purged of Jews who were accused of having mistreated uh, crackers. Uh, you know, it, it, so, so, so the question is, does the belief in the transubstantiation, which is a belief that I would have thought uh, could be rather harmless, have anything to do with the idea that someone can mistreat a cracker uh, and that you should kill him for it. Yes, it does have something to do. It's impossible to believe in the torture of crackers unless mm -hmm. you think transubstantiation is a fact. But what it's not impossible to believe in is the torture of one group by another. And that Granted, is, yeah. as you know, virtually universal in human history. And it's and given so the immense question, energy by the question arises. Hatred. The question arises, in what sort of regime are you likely to be able to get a society a la America where that is minimized. And it seems to me quite clear that if you look through history, although the depredations of religion, we could spend all night talking about the terrible things that have happened in the name of religion. But that would have much more power if you took essentially good people and made them rotten, as opposed to taking people who are predisposed to both good and evil actions and given them um, distinct identities one from the other nation states, religions, neighborhoods, so on. And what you get almost inevitably is the action of one group against the other. And in fact, the only transcendent idea that I can think of that really does tie one person to another is God, which is why when you actually filter that book through a person, as opposed to say, just opening Deuteronomy, which mm. no tradition that I know of suggests is a way to learn morality. But when you filter it through a person, you get someone like Isaiah, who criticizes Jews on the basis of the Bible that he knows far better than we. Or Hillel, who when he's asked to summarize an entire tradition, knowing it intimately and intricately, doesn't say, go persecute someone. He says, what's hateful to you, don't do to someone else. Because even though you can cherry pick lines that are both funny and destructive, the truth is that every tradition is not made just of propositions. It's something that's lived and is bred in you, and if it works well, produces magnificent human beings. Yeah, and, and the problem is there are many gods and books on offer. Yes. And they make incompatible claims about yes. how we should live in this world. That's true. Uh, so, so uh, again, the, 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 the hope, I mean, you're proffering a hope for uh, humanity, which is the right religion most of the time. Um, I don't know how this is going to uh, interact well with the, the spread of destructive technology. I, mean, I don't know how we're going to get right. to a future where uh, Muslims believing in martyrdom and Christians believing in the rapture will be a good recipe for good neighbors. Um, I, I, so I, I, I think that is a kind of a reductio ad absurdum of this, of this more religion argument. Um, 
again, I reject the analogy to the, uh, the most repressive totalitarianisms of the 21st century. This is, I'm simply arguing that we need, we, we need to cease to reward people for pretending to know things they do not know. And the only area of discourse where we do this is, in, is, is on the subject of God. Uh, and I, I would, let me ask you. On, on the issue of uncertainty, I'm curious how you two reacted to news this year. Uh, this is the year the world learned that uh, Mother Teresa, mm. Calcutta, suffered her own crisis of faith. And uh, she wrote some letters which were published. And in one of the letters, she wrote the following. I am told God loves me. And yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. Mother Teresa. Yeah. Did, were, you, were you surprised? What did you uh, think of that? Well, there was a certain gratification that spread in the atheist community. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ill-concealed. Ill yeah. um, I mean, the, the one thing I would say about that is that uh, the other thing that, that Mother Teresa's letters uh, articulate is the process she went through uh, of confessing her doubts to her superiors. And at one point, it was recommended that she view all of this as a sign that she was sharing Jesus' suffering on the cross. Um, now, this is kind of a brilliant moment of hermetically sealing a, uh, uh, a worldview. Um, and so when I wrote about this, I said, ask yourself, when even the doubts of experts are used to confirm a doctrine, how could it possibly be disproved? And this is, this is you see this all the time yeah. in religion. You do. And this is precisely what you don't see in science. That's uh, right. Um, but that's not a bad thing. First of all, ask yourself this. Even despite her doubts, if Mother Teresa weren't a devout Christian, do you think that she would have spent her life among the lepers of Calcutta? Many secular people do just that sort of thing. I mean, Talk, this, I'm this talking, is, this is a, I mean, seriously percentages in terms of the kind of self-sacrificing work that she did the truth is that it is, far, not only is it far higher in terms of religious people, but I'll tell you something else in which Mother Teresa is an anomaly. Are you aware of the fact that overwhelmingly in study after study, and I can show you a notebook full of them, that religious people are psychologically happier, have better family lives, um, feel less lowered anxiety, um, on and on. I mean, I can give you a whole list of things and all the studies. And that also, it seems to me, makes some argument because everything in the world that human beings need in order to survive and to thrive exists in the world. Other people, food, sleep, God. Those things that the human soul craves and needs are real. And you have two choices. It could be that we were tossed up <clears throat> by an accident of ancient chemistry, in which case it's remarkable to think that this product of evolution by blind forces could really understand the world around us. I mean, why in the world should science work if your brain is purely a product of evolution? Right? There's no reason why you should understand the world or be able to understand the world. Or it is possible that it, you're not just a product of blind forces. And neither, despite the darkness that she felt in her soul at times, was Mother Teresa, which is precisely why we not only can understand the world, but we can understand more than the world, because our origin is of the world and also not of the world. And the reason that our minds can do something more than just operate on instinct is because we operate all the time with things that are not physical. Right? Ideas, words, I can say something and change the physiology of your brain. Now, how is that? Unless there's something more to your brain than physiology. Okay. So, now, this is, this is uh, I've kind of let you run on there for a while because... Um, <laughs> An awfully, awfully yeah. Christian of you there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I certainly, I didn't mean that... Uh, 
uh, disparagingly, no. but okay. you were essentially talking the talk of science or attempting to talk the talk of science. No. You're talking about no. the basis of ideas in the brain or they couldn't possibly be rooted in the brain. No. They're non-physical. I yes. mean, that, that's prejudging the, the, essentially the mind-body problem. Yep. Um, you're talking about the, the uh, improbability of all of this emerging out of uh, the early chemistry of the earth. I mean, don't we need an intelligent designer of some kind to do that? These are scientific claims. Um, and it's, it's ironic that religious people generally talk about humility, talk about the arrogance being on the side of science, and, that, and, and then at the drop of a hat weigh in on scientific claims uh, and, make, and make claims about uh, the nature of the universe that no cosmologist can make, that no biologist can make. I mean, this is, uh, this is I have lots of cosmologists and biologists who make the identical claims that I did, but they're actually not scientific claims. They're philosophical claims. Well, not, well many of them are scientific. I mean, the, when you're talking about probabilities, when you're talking about the relationship of mind to matter, these are, um, it, these are scientific claims. And we know that... Uh, <sighs> Almost everything you take yourself to be as a matter of subjectivity uh, has its basis in the brain. And we know this for, and with, the, with one exception, I mean, I have written about this, that you know, we have not reduced consciousness itself to That's brain function. That's a fairly formidable exception. It's, it's, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. But everything else you take yourself to be as a matter of mind your ability to recognize faces and speak English and form c concepts. Um, I mean, people have this, this naive idea. When, when you think of yourself as a soul that may yet survive your death, you are thinking of yourself very much intact. I mean, the, the stories of going into the tunnel of light and recognizing grandma uh, entail a fair amount of mentality. Mentality we know can be disrupted at the level of the brain. Uh, because we, we see these neurological complaints all the time. Uh, and the, the proposition is that if you damage a brain a little bit, you destroy English the, and uh, an ability to recognize faces. But if you damage it totally at death, lo and behold, the soul, still able to recognize grandma, will rise off the brain uh, and, and go into a tunnel of light. These are, these are scientific claims, and they are profoundly naive. It's not a scientific claim. It may be a scientific claim to say that my ability to speak English can't be disrupted by disrupting my brain. But the essence of what a human being is, which is the one thing that you say we don't have a scientific explanation for, is consciousness. Well, I include, and, uh, it's, it's not just human and, beings. It's dogs. It's, it's, we don't, although, we, we very, don't know yes, where consciousness emerges yes, in, in the natural world. We don't order. know where. We don't know where it emerges. Or self-consciousness, although self-consciousness is probably different from consciousness in animals. That would be my guess. Um, but it isn't just that. The morality, consciousness, all these things which are susceptible of scientific exploration are not, scientific, are not susceptible of scientific explanation because they're not scientific questions. When you ask, for example... You don't think depression could be susceptible to a scientific... Sure, account? I absolutely do. So where, where, where do you draw a line between a, a mental state like depression Right. And one and the joy. existence of a mental state, and the existence of a sense of identity that makes you a human being that could transcend your death. The point is that if you believe in that existence of, of identity as a human being, it can even be diminished in this world, but it doesn't mean that it's diminished forever. In the same way that it didn't exist before it came into this world, which to me doesn't mean that it didn't exist in some state that we don't understand. Right? Okay. Before I was born, I wasn't conscious of me. Does that mean that I really didn't exist at all? That, to me, is a religious claim. You, not a you don't exist. Many people claim to find it impossible to believe or to imagine that they won't exist after death. Um, just try it for a second. I mean, you, you imagine that everyone in Paris right now is getting along fine without all of us. I mean, none of us are in Paris. We are really, really materially absent from whatever is going on in every other city on this planet right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you were absent for all of human history before your birth. Uh, the idea that you, that you simply can't imagine not existing after death is really kind of a, just for lack of trying, I think. <laughs> 
Uh, and, so, and this, granted, this is terrifying. And I think it's, it's terrifying not so much in our own case, but it's terrifying in the case of those we love. And we are, we are terrified to lose the people we love in this world. Um, that is an objective fact, if there, if there is one in this area. Uh, and religion is the strategy we have adopted to keep that terror at bay. So if it's to not religion, then what do you have? Well, it, it, it's not that you necessarily have a replacement for everything religion does on every question. I mean, there's a, you don't replace the belief in Santa Claus with something that does exactly what the belief in Santa Claus did. You know, equally consoling, equally motivating on Christmas morning. I mean, it just it doesn't happen. Except that it's just not true that religion is the strategy that we've adopted to deal with that fear. Religion is infinitely more than that and more complicated than that. Religion is also the strategy, if you call it a strategy, I mean, religion is also the recognition that the world is filled with an order that is inaccessible to measurement and reason. It's the recognition that human beings have a certain purpose in this world. Um, it's the things, actually, that you espouse, although you don't espouse them with a religious um, purpose. I mean, it's the thing that gives, that gives meaning to what you say when you say this form of religion is bad and this form of religion is good. A moral judgment for which you have no basis if there is, in fact, no moral order, if it's just well, No, no, I, your... I, d I absolutely did not say there was no moral order. So this is... Well, where does the moral order come from? Okay, this is, this is something I want you to all know. Before we talk on, on that level, I want a kind of a big picture view for, uh, for you all to notice. There, there are three ways to defend religion. One is to argue that religion is true, that, it, that one specific religion is true, or that God exists, or that the Bible was really dictated by, by him. Um, another is to argue that religion is useful. Okay, right. and this is, this is a religion is yes. useful argument. The, uh, religion is the basis for morality. This is, please notice that this is a very different track to run on, and it says nothing at all about oh, whether sure or not God does. exists. Of course it, it, it needs, does. No, no, because if I can, oh, if I can of course it does. You, okay, no, I'm sorry. You can't on, characterize please. my strategy well, and no, not let me let, tell you that you're wrong. But let me finish let the point. Finish yes. Okay. Feel free to tell me I'm wrong, but just hear, hear what I'm claiming. Okay. Even if I conceded that religion is, is profoundly useful, so useful as to be indispensable, you know, people without religion will just rape and kill each other, and we, we don't want that, so by all means, fill the churches and mosques and synagogues. Uh, that would not, for a moment, grant credence to the idea that one of our books was dictated by an omniscient being or that such a being exists. All religion could function like a placebo. And we, I mean, we, I could invent a religion for you right now that would be guaranteed to be useful. In fact, more useful than any religion in existence, and you would know it would be untrue. I mean, I could. Right this moment, I could invent a religion which the precept is be kind to others, don't lie, cheat, steal, or kill. And this is where it gets novel. Make sure your children uh, make every effort to understand science and mathematics to the best of their abilities. And if you don't By do the way, this, you could take that right out of Maimonides. He said that. Okay, but, and if you don't do that, you'll be tortured for eternity after death by a 17-headed demon named... Dexter. Okay. <laughs> if we could spread this faith to billions right now, we would live in a better world. Absolutely. If we could replace Islam with this faith, we would live in a better world, for starters. Okay? But that wouldn't lend the slightest credence to the idea that such a demon exists or that torture can, after death. Can I tell you now why I disagree? Okay. okay. So well, you're going to argue that it would it, lend credence? It, it, well, it, uh, you're about to hear what I'm going to argue. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> If you live in a world in which the laws of that world fit with the natural world, then it suggests that, in fact, you are living the way you are supposed to live, the way that the world intends you to live. If there is, I'm not saying this is a proof, but that it's a support, no doubt. If there is a God who ordains a certain morality and you live that morality and in fact it creates a good society and a happy life and all those things, then of course it lends credence to the idea that the world is designed a certain way by a designer who wants a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And when you say, well, I'm going to take all those moral principles and separate them from God and watch, if you do those and you learn science, you're going to live a good life, all I would say is absolutely it does. 
That's exactly what religion has been saying, and the reason it has been saying that is because religion is based on the notion that there is this invisible order which human beings can participate in mm -hmm. that is ordained by something that is transcendent, and all those things combine to provide the religious person not with proof, because you don't ask for the same kind of proof that you do in science, but with conviction well, that that's yeah. true. It's, well, it's not a question of convenience. It's not a question of convenience. Do you ask for the same? If I say Sam Harris's prose is straightforward, do you say, "Oh, it's very convenient that you don't have to prove that scientifically"? No, you say correctly. Straight, the judgment of straightforward prose, even though it may be universally shared, is not something that's susceptible of scientific proof. It's just I, the way it is. Or if I say Saul Bell is a wonderful writer, and you yes, say to me, "Put that in a test tube," claim. put no. that in a test tube, or I won't believe it. Yes, no, no, but no, no. The existence of God is not a scientific claim. No scientist and no atheist has ever argued that that every claim is scientific or needs to be subjected to that kind of proof. I, I this is this is really a matter of common sense, and yet religious yes, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. It is a matter of common sense, and yet it's violated all the time when you say to me. Why isn't there any proof for God? And the answer is, it's not a scientific claim. That's exactly, no, I mean, but, for the last, but, I don't yeah, know, yeah. 45 minutes, that's what I've been trying this to say. People, what people actually believe yeah. is, that, is that, one, they're rewarded after death in certain circumstances. They will, they will be rewarded. There's a difference between an eternity of happiness right. and an eternity of suffering. And it really matters what, you, what name you call God and what you believe and the precise kinds of practices you engage. And, and in, in the case of Islam, it matters if you die in the right circumstances and nothing's more auspicious so, than dying a martyr. So I'm happy to make common cause with you to say this kind of religion is bad religion. Okay, but, but when you extrapolate that to Two, all religion is bad and we should have the end of faith what you're doing is you're doing the equivalent of saying because there is junk science let's throw out all the PhDs no it's it's a false analogy I'm, I'm, I'm objecting to the very thing you are typifying in this conversation you are saying that religion is not a matter of making those claims to knowledge Religion. No, I said God isn't. God, the God belief in God. Yeah, those okay. two are not but, identical. Religion but why, is why a they path to God. Because religion is a path to God. What, what are you That's calling what God? Is. Where, where is, am I calling where, God? Where is God? God is the intangible creator of the universe in whose yeah. presence a human being can live and according to whose dictates or will a human being can live in this world. But what, what is your evidence for the existence of God I right now? I don't have evidence because it's not a scientific claim. Okay, but unless I can, I can you want to say, thing. unless you want to say, oh, well, I mean, I shouldn't say it that way. I don't have proof because it's not a scientific claim. If you want a supporting idea, I would say my understanding of other human beings and my experience of other human beings, which leads me to believe that there's something more than material. My understanding of the design of the world, which leads me to believe that we're here not by accident. My appreciation of the fact that human beings, even though we are made of stuff, have consciousness, which leads philosophers like Galen Strawson to assume that even rudimentary material has consciousness because mm -hmm. he can't explain how consciousness arises. Right. My experience of religious human beings and the way they live and the fact that they live in harmony to my perception with an invisible order that gives them a life of a certain sanctity and this holiness. Is, this is a general thing. Religious you're asking, human beings I mean, generally live in harmony with, with... No, I, I said my experience of certain human beings. I mean, I can keep going if you want me to keep going. Well, no, I, I think you've put enough on the table. That okay, but yeah. all, none of those are scientific evidence. That, many of those, that, many yeah. of those claims trespass upon the territory of science overtly. I mean, the, the claim about... Mm -hmm. your, your understanding of a human beings being suggestive of a divine mm -hmm. artificer. Is that um, a scientific claim? Absolutely. Extraordinary. I mean, is, is your understanding of mathematics also suggestive of a divine art artificer? No, it has to do with my experience. Your ability to learn language? Do you understand? It has to do with my experience of you. When I'm looking at you right now, right. Mm -hmm. you may assume that what I see is a material, but that's not what I see. And it's not what I believe. And I, I think that I there's understand something, it's not what you there's believe. There's something I'm... in you that is more than you believe. I really think so. This is now. A, if you want, if you want to make that, if you want to make that a scientific claim, you can. But I'm telling you, it's a metaphysical claim, and to confuse the two is a mistake. Okay, you you can add any metaphysics you want. Thank you. In, in that, by that means, I mean, I, I can say, I, you know, I see you right. as um, reincar a reincarnate personality, and I think you were probably. Uh, I was someone famous on Atlantis. Yes. Right. Don't make um, me like a washerwoman in a pe previous. People. <laughs> 
people think, do this all the time. I mean, you, you can broadcast, I mean, this is, this is constrained by our common sense in every other domain of discourse. I mean, just take, for example, the people who think Elvis is still alive, okay? What, what's wrong with this claim? I mean, why is this claim not vitiating our academic departments and corporations? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll tell you why, and it's, it's very simple. We have not passed laws against believing Elvis is still alive. It just, it, the problem is that whenever somebody seriously represents his belief that Elvis is still alive, in a conversation, in, in, on a first date, at a lecture, at a job interview, mm -hmm. uh, he immediately pays a price. Yeah. 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 He, he pays a price in ill-concealed laughter. Right. Now, okay. now, surely you can agree that, with him that, on that. that. That is a good thing. Now, he, now, then he could rattle on about, this is not a scientific claim, uh, this is a matter of faith. You know, when I look at you, I, I see you, you might be Elvis. I mean, he, he, could, he could do this. Except that, yeah. you know, this is, this is like the, the, I mean, almost all the books, I don't believe it's in your book, to your credit, but the, the, Bertrand, Russell, the Bertrand Russell teapot analogy, yeah. right, which Dawkins is so fond of, um, that there might be a celestial teapot circling the globe. Um, I think it's in my book, too. Is it? Yeah. Shame on you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> If you make a claim about the existence of a physical entity like Elvis or a teapot, yes, that is, evalu that is evaluated the way you evaluate any other physical entity. Mm. That's why I keep saying, and I will say it again, that it is not a scientific claim to say that I believe you have a soul or that God exists. If it were a scientific claim, then you would be able to evaluate it the same way you could get a microscope, uh, telescope and look for a teapot, mm. but you can't. Let me ask a question that deals with, um, change gears on you guys here. Yeah. A um, question that deals with human creativity. Mm -hmm. okay. um, religion has inspired a lot of great works. Look at the world of music, um, you know, physical, or the uh, visual arts. Okay, let's just for a second say the world comes over to your way of thinking. Right. How does that affect the arts? Music, literature, The Simpsons. You know. um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious, what, what, what would... Uh, what would that well, the the world, theory, creative world be yeah. Yeah. without that? I, th I think it's a, it's a false fear, um, the idea that we wouldn't find any reason to build beautiful architecture or uh, paint nice paintings, uh, but for indulging certain religious superstitions. Um, it's just not, it's, it's I think a, Feynman once wrote that he was a poor poet who must fall silent when he finds out that the sun is actually a massive sphere of hydrogen fusing into helium. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, the, the claim is that you have to take something on faith to be creative, and it's, it's um, uh, I think it's a product of a, an argument that you used briefly early on, which is a, is a fallacious one, this idea that, that uh, the percentages of people who do these, great, I think you used it in the, in the in terms of goodness, not in terms of art. Yeah, in right, terms right, of goodness. Right, right. Most people... Was it not fallacious in goodness? Yeah. I'm just well, yeah, curious. No, it's, oh, it's that fallacious. Okay. Um, most people are uh, doing this good work, are doing it for religious reasons. Well, most people, most of the time, have been religious throughout human history. There has been no one else to do the job. This is true. Yeah. I mean, most people who have plucked chickens have plucked them while believing in God. That does not mean you need to believe in God to pluck a chicken. That is precisely why... Yeah. That is precisely why it's important to look at the 20th century and the 19th century when it was possible to have societies that didn't believe in God and to see what happened. But you have and to when I what did that, you said, in. when I did that, you said, but they didn't believe what I believe. And what I'm saying well, is that if very you had Very few people do believe what you believe, apparently. No, no, I being Sam Harris here, not I, what I, David well, Wolpe, believe. Well, you well, said, when I said, when I said Napoleon, the French terror, the Civil War, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, all these, all these, as soon as it became possible to have non-religious regimes, look what happened to the world, you said, but what about people who believe what I do? And what I'm saying to you is that thus far in the world, extraordinarily enough, when you remove religion from a society, it is not ruled by Sam Harris's. That's not the way it seems to work. Now, you'll tell me this is a utilitarian argument, and indeed it is. Mm -hmm. This doesn't prove that religion is true, but it certainly does prove 
that there is a values vacuum in societies when you suck religion out of it or force it out that is, to my way of thinking, terrifying. It, it, does, not, it does not prove that simply because you have to look at what else these people believe. Uh, there is a values vacuum in religion. There's a values vacuum in a, an organization like the Catholic Church that, that preaches the sinfulness of condom use in sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, I agree with you. Okay, there, there's a values vacuum in that right. same institution that shelters its pedophile priests, yep. literally an army of child rapists, yes. based on its own intent upon maintaining its integrity as a religious institution. There's a values vacuum in, if, and I could, I could go on. And so, it's, it's, it's not like right. religion is this, this uh, perfect advertisement for the kinds of values you get once you believe that your book nope, is it is, by the it is an imperfect. It is an imperfect institution that is adopted by imperfect people in an imperfect world. And if you expect that it's going to be perfect, then you will be consistently disappointed. And that's why every religion that I know of emphasizes the fact that goodness is a continual and often failed struggle. And, as does and science. One, as and one science. would expect that the, well, science doesn't emphasize that goodness is a continual but failed sure, struggle, right? Sure. I mean, certain scientists may, but science as a whole doesn't say anything about the metaphysical nature of human goodness. And by the way, Richard Feynman said explicitly that uh, science and religion ought to be able to coexist. So I'm glad that you quoted well, him because okay. that well, lets I'm me get that right little aperture in. Yeah. I'm yes. going to step in here now. I'm getting the signal over there that, uh, do we have the microphone available for questions? Where is uh, Gaddy? Do we have someone uh, on this side who has a question? Yes, please. Rabbi Wolfie, yes. at the beginning of this discussion, Sam Harris talked about the Bible and how human sacrifice is uh, pervasive in the Bible and how the, Hebrew, the ancient Hebrews practiced it, but you didn't respond to that. No. And I wonder what uh, your response would be. Sure. I, I, want, I didn't say that it was pervasive. I want to, don't want to. Uh, the answer is that human sacrifice was actually was pervasive around the, uh, the civilization of the Bible. And in fact, Gehenna, which is the Hebrew word for hell, is based on the fact that in the valley outside Jerusalem, that's where the pagan peoples around the Israelites did sacrifice children, which gives you some sense of the meaning of sacrificing children in Hebrew um, tradition. Yiftach was the only one who actually sacrificed a child and is condemned by it all through uh, Jewish literature. Abraham, the point of the Abraham story, according to many commentators, which I take to be, is precisely to say that although the gods of the world up to that time do demand human sacrifice, God doesn't, which is why, as the psychologist Eric Wellish says, the key phrase in that story is, don't raise your hand against the boy or do anything to him, right? That's what the angel says to Abraham when Abraham raises the knife, and that's the key message. So to say that the Hebrew that either the Hebrew people, the Israelite people, or the Bible advocates human sacrifice, and I'm not putting that in your mouth, but to suggest that is, uh, is it's just a travesty of the Bible. Well, I'd add a few codas there. It's a, the picture is not quite that rosy. First of all, the, the Abraham story does not end with any uh, resolute condemnation of human sacrifice. There are a few lines where God condemns human sacrifice in, in Deuteronomy mm -hmm. and uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, there are a few lines, with a few moments where he tacitly rewards it in the in the sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter. You might know that story. That's what um, I yeah, just mentioned. Okay. Right. Uh, there are there's a place where where God claims to have uh, gotten the pagans to have. This is in Ezekiel. He's got the pagans to practice human sacrifice so as to. Uh, further defile them, and we might question the morality of God on that. You point. might, but that does suggest clearly that in the mind of Ezekiel, human sacrifice is a terrible thing. Yes, it's, it, it, it go, it's, it's by no means as clear as you would want to be. It is the most terrible thing. It's a needless horror imposed upon by ignorant people on ignorant people. And in other words, that sacrifice no, which they did not practice and condemn well, though, though, though is a did. mindless horror by ignorant people on ignorant people. They, first of all, they, 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 they practice it. 
they, they got the substitution of animals. It's right. The, the, best, the best God could think of was to substitute animals for this blood sacrifice. Uh, so, I mean, how many people in this room think animal sacrifice is somehow really as good as it gets? I'm in just terms curious. Of how, many, how, many of you, how many of you eat meat? Just raise your hand. And when that animal is killed for the meat that you eat, is it a sacramental thing that feels holy when you understand you're doing something about taking a life? Or do you let the slaughterhouse just kill the animal and you buy it in saran wrap? Mm -hmm. Just curious. Not so easy. Oh, okay. uh, question over here. We're going to go back and, back and forth. Yes, sir. Mr. Harris, uh, you got pushed into a corner a couple times on the issue of utility, if not, if not on the epistemic issue. Uh, uh -huh. And it seems like... Uh, for a bunch of reasons, including like building imperfection and so preventing scapegoating, uh, there is a degree to which it's tough to institutionalize skepticism. Uh, it leaves a, a complete vacuum, not an imperfection, when we try to suck it out of society. If that should turn out to be true, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, an indict of at least the new atheist movement, if not of small forms like this where we discuss the epistemic validity of God? Uh, is there an idea that we shouldn't be going outside telling people to be skeptical of God because it leads to a bad society? Yeah, no, I, it, it's not a... Um uh, there are kind of two levels on which I heard your question. I mean, how did you mean skepticism? Skepticism in terms of... In, in every time where uh, the rabbi said uh, atheist society has gone bad, you're like, yeah, that's not my atheist society. That's an ideology. Well, I no, no. The, the, the thing is, it, it's just a, it's a false analogy because what, is, what was operative there was not too much skeptical inquiry on the nature of God. Uh, too much, an unwillingness to believe in the divine origin of certain books. What was operative there were other ideas, ideas about the purity of German blood in the case of the Holocaust, ideas about um, uh, economics and, and rather bogus ideas about science in the case of communism. And these were other ideas and just this, the rampages of tribalism and greed and megalomania on the parts of, of, of uh, certain leaders. It, other things were operative. It's not. I, mean, I want to make it very clear. I'm not holding religion accountable for all the bad things religious people have done in the world. I'm, I'm holding it accountable for all the bad things they only they only could have done because of religion. Okay, and this is that. That's why this the calling Stalin an atheist is a false argument. He he was not moved on the basis of his critical inquiry, on the basis of his uh, lack of faith to kill d tens of millions of people. I want to clarify that, because I agree with you, but I don't think you're addressing the point. The question is not, I'm not saying that, you know, put an atheist in and look at the terrible things they'll do. I, I don't want to be understood to be saying that. What I'm saying is, when you remove religion forcibly from a society, the question, and then I think this is what the questioner is asking, is, I mean, history shows that you get so far a terrible result. So the question is, can you in fact institutionalize no. This wonderful skeptical inquiry, scientific basis that you assume but since he's not suggesting doing it, doing yeah, it forcibly. Yeah, no, nobody no, is I, suggesting a program here. I'm suggesting no, a, no, a program. A, yeah. Exactly yeah. what we do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. worse. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's exactly what we do with Elvis. I mean, yeah. or, or astrology, or anything else that that. Uh, gets laughed off the dais. I mean, just imagine if, or, or it's what we do with any other god but the god of Abraham. Imagine a, a, a political candidate who was, who was forthcoming about his belief in Poseidon. It would be a problem. He could not possibly get elected. Uh, it's not like someone has proved that Poseidon doesn't exist. I mean, that is Russell's teapot. You cannot prove that Poseidon doesn't exist. The question is, is there any good reason to believe he exists? The answer is no. It's the same answer for the God, God of Abraham. Okay, question over here, sir. Uh, this is for first Mr. Harris, and I guess uh, Rabbi Wolpe will respond. Uh, you had mentioned that there were three ways, I believe, to defend religion. The argument about truth, the argument about utility, but I didn't, get you, I didn't catch the third, and oh, I don't think you, you got to the third, because I think uh, yeah, the third you went off on some tangents, and I was curious what the right, third right. was and uh, uh, what, uh, what the response to that would be. Well, the third is simply to attack atheism essentially as another religion, to say that it's intolerant, dogmatic, right. that, that, it, that it relies on 
on the same kind of, it's, it, Rick Warren said it when I debated him for Newsweek, you know, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, he said, because it's, it's the most gratuitous faith claim of all. It's the claim that the universe came out of nothing. Who could believe that? I mean, that's, a, that's essentially the, the third. Okay. Uh, for that. Yeah. Question yeah. over here. Yes, uh, Rabbi, before you were saying that um, your belief in a soul or belief in God is a, a metaphysical claim, not a scientific claim, which I guess means essentially it's a leap of faith. If, if it's a question of a, of a belief in faith, then, then why, in the words of Rodney King, can't we all just get along? Why are religions fighting one another, killing one another, over something that essentially is a fairy yeah, tale? It's a, well, however, I was with you until the last two words. Okay, so let's, let's put the fairy tale phrase aside. And look, I, this, is, this is a critical question, and I, I would give... I would give two separate answers to it, both of which I think are complementary in both. First of all, it's very rare, not unprecedented, the Crusades are probably oppressive. It's very rare for religions to fight each other for no other reason than religion. You always got politics. You've always got I, land. Well, you've always really got religious economic. Jews throw what? dirty diapers onto other Jews in Israel because they're not really. No, no, no. no we're, we're, not we're not talking about disapproval. You're talking about serious conflict, right? And if you're talking about why Palestinians and Jews fight, why Muslim, why Pakistan and India fight, it's not just oh my God, they're a religion. Okay, that's first. The second issue is I don't I, I don't believe is a religious issue. The second issue is an otherness issue. Anybody who believes that human beings are basically good and kind towards one another has never visited a playground, right? All you have to do, just go see how kids treat a kid when he first walks into the playground, because he's the other, right? And the challenge to religion is to transcend the treatment of the other, which at, at its best it does, and at its worst it doesn't. But the reinforcement of there the other happens not only in religion. It, I mean, why did France and Britain f fight a hundred year war with each other? It's not because of religion, it's because the damn Frenchmen and the damn British, right? Mm -hmm. And that's ingrained in us, and that's what we need to overcome. Thank you. Uh, see, question over here. Yeah. Mr. Harris, these are four uh, short quotes from your book, The End of Faith. Mm -hmm. While religious people are not generally mad, their core beliefs absolutely are. <laughs> It is difficult to imagine a set of beliefs more suggestive of mental illness than those that lie at the heart of many of our religious traditions. Theology is now little more than a branch of human ignorance. And last, people who harbor strong convictions without evidence belong at the margins of our societies, not in our halls of power. Mm -hmm. So with that said, how dangerous do you think our world is when our own leaders, especially our presidential candidates from a supposed superpower, profess such devotion to the supernatural? Um, well, clearly I'm worried. I mean, I wouldn't be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's... It, a few things to say here. It's easy to uh, exaggerate the problem, and it's easy to to uh, overlook very important differences among religions. I mean, one pro one problem with a discussion like this is we have a word religion right. that is a suitcase term. I mean, religion is a is a word like sport. You know, you have you have a sport like you know tie boxing where people get killed and hit in the head with elbows and knees, and then you have a sport like lawn bowling, you know, and it, what is in common between these sports apart from breathing? You know, not much. And so, and yet they're both sports. And religion is like that. You have a religion uh, like Jainism, which I occasionally reference because it is the, is the one truly nonviolent religion. I mean, the, the, the core dogma of Jainism is nonviolence. So, so that no matter how fanatical you get as a Jain, you are never going to be, be a Jain suicide bomber. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> You simply cannot make sense of it by the lights of Jainism. Now, by no stretch of the imagination is Islam a religion of nonviolence. Islam is a religion of violence in certain circumstances, and it is a great danger to us all that these circumstances can be constru can construed with enough agility as to apply almost anywhere, anytime, to anyone who wants to die for, for the faith. Now, I'm not saying all Muslims view their religion this way, but there are, there are very few tools within Islam 
by which to say, oh, Osama bin Laden has completely misconstrued the faith. He has not completely misconstrued the faith. So, but, so, so between Islam and Jainism, you know, we have a, a range of convictions and behaviors born of them. Uh, and the kind of, the style of, of discourse that you're using to talk about, again, what religion should be, not what it is, I would argue, uh, just, just obfuscates this terrain. We have people really killing and dying based on propositions that they are granting credence to. And, the, and, and these beliefs are thriving in, in an in a context in which they are immune to criticism. And we, and we are collaborating in that process by not criticizing them publicly, incessantly, relentlessly until we break this spell. I see. And now, now another question on the floor. Well, I, well be, I, I hear religion talk on many different levels tonight. And I, I, I believe you believe in God. But I'm wondering about the other religions. And how do you determine that your religion is the right religion and your religion is the true path to God, as opposed to seven uh, two uh, virgins waiting for me in heaven or, or, or Jesus Christ coming back to save me? And I, and I, I don't understand how religious people right. are, are convinced that their religion is right. And I, where, where does that come from? Well, I mean, I always say when people ask me that it's my job to, to argue Judaism's excellence, not its superiority. I'm actually not concerned to make truth claims over other religions because religion is not just a matter of propositions. It's also a lived life. The way that I understand it is religion is an orientation and a system of patterns and behaviors that allows you to live in the presence of and with the consciousness of God. I assume that other religions can do that too. What I evaluate in other religions are the things about them that impinge on the rest of the world, like Sam was just talking about, right? If, you, if you're a suicide bomber, then I condemn that in your religion, which leads you to do that. But I have no idea how, to what extent a Muslim or a Christian exists in the presence of God, except in as much as they tell me that they do. So that, for me, is sufficient. It seems to me that religious tolerance consists exactly in that. That is, I practice my religion because it gives me all the things that it gives me and because I believe it to be true. It doesn't mean that I have to uh, belittle or dismiss the paths of other faiths. Question over here. Uh, Rabbi Wolpe, if uh, we go back in time and find a group of Jews a thousand years ago, a couple thousand years ago, who were devoutly religious and kept the Sabbath and, you know, did all the rules, but also owned slaves and on Sunday would stone adulterers and right. homosexuals and anybody else the Bible says to stone, would you say that they're good people according to your view of what God wants from us? And if those same people, we found a tribe in Africa who kept those same rules today, would you also say they were good? Well, if you ask a thousand years ago, let's, let's just assume they weren't religious and they owned slaves. Then you could evaluate them one of two ways. In the context of their time, were they good? You might consider them good. In the context of what we would call eternal values or today, no, they clearly weren't good. And you would say the same thing about a tribe in Africa, which is that they were morally undeveloped. Right? Um, so that to me, I mean, but my understanding of religions is that they go through a spiritual evolution, which is, by the way, not only, I didn't invent this. I mean, look in Maimonides when we're talking about animal sacrifices. You know why Maimonides said that God instituted animal sacrifices? Because he was weaning the Israelites off an atmosphere and a society in which people actually sacrificed human beings, just as Sam said, um, in an echo of Maimonides, and that suggested that eventually you wouldn't need animal sacrifices either. So the idea that spiritual Actually, one evolves, that seems to me perfectly compatible with faiths. You wouldn't expect that God could give a message that could be absorbed equally in every society at every time. Rather, over time, messages get refined, understood better, and lived better. Do you Wait want to comment on that? Yeah. You've talked about the adherence yeah. to the holy books, though. Yeah. Um, 
I don't think he answered your question. I think it was a very good question. Um, two claims here. One is that um, you almost made it explicitly. Uh, it was certainly implicit. The idea is that at the time, I mean, the Canaanites were so ill-behaved that just getting together a coherent list of reasons to kill your neighbor was an improvement over the general barbarity of the time. <laughs> And that essentially this is what... Wow, that was is. implicit in what I said? That's yes, remarkable. Yes, no, the, I, the idea that, that, every, that these people are I'm just... so much more suggestive than I realized. Yeah, I, well, no, I, I, I got to say, it didn't cross my mind, feel, but go ahead. Feel, go ahead. feel free to, uh, to yes. amend your statement. No problem. Um, he, he just did. <laughs> but this, or, in fact, to make it again yes. so that it'll be understood. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is often claimed, the idea that the Bible is just the best that was possible for that community in that period in history. You know, the 5th century B.C. was an age of such barbarism that Leviticus is really kind of a, it's like the, you know, the U.S. Constitution, a brilliant document. Uh, it is not a brilliant document. It is, it is an appalling guide to morality. Uh, and, the, and just think of how good a book, just think of how good a book would be if it were authored by the creator of the universe. I mean, there's not a single sentence in any book of the Bible that could not have been written by somebody living in the Iron Age. This is a problem for claiming that this is the best book we have. Uh, and, and so the, the, the problem is, if you're going to live, if you're living by Leviticus and Deuteronomy, uh, you should be a good Jew for all time. Now, why are you not a good Jew for stoning, stoning your neighbor for working on the Sabbath today? You are not because we have different standards of morality and, and reasonableness. Uh, and and we, we happily we do. And those came from outside of religion. No, those did not, no. They, it, no, it's Sorry. true. They were, they were all religious people okay. dealing with the strains yeah, of science. Well, no, and exactly. Well, what I would say is that that's only if you see any document as a static document. But if you understand, I mean, look, the, the rabbis, for example, and, and I didn't understand this to be your question, but I'm happy to answer it. The rabbi said about stoning a rebellious child, the rabbis, who believe me, their morality was not shaped by the Constitution, right? Their morality was shaped by the Bible, which is the world in which they live. They said, this never was and never will be. Now, why did they say that? Because their, con their sense that God doesn't want a child to be stoned, that is, their judgment of the Bible arose from the Bible itself. Their judgment of morality is something that was steeped in those books and in that text and in the community that interprets that text. And to see it only as this is a sentence that the Bible says and therefore I judge the book as to be illegitimate neglects the fact that every religious text is a text that gets interpreted through a community. That's what makes a religious you, text. You actually think the book would not be improved? if we just change that line about stoning your children to death for talking back to you? I would say that it, it wouldn't be more, the moral vision of the Bible would not be upgraded just I a mean, notch? No, I, well, not the moral vision of the community that emerges from the Bible and struggled with the Bible wouldn't be. And if you ask me, I mean, although you're not asking me, um, I, don't think, I don't think that the Bible is a verbal record of the revelation of God to human beings. I think that it's a human product of God's self-revelation. So I expect there to be in that book lots of things that emerge from that society. That's exactly what you would wouldn't, expect. Wouldn't you be on firmer ground if it were just unambiguously the most brilliant treatise on morality and still just, just stood the test of time even today? I mean, just repudiated slavery? Um, I mean, you, you and I could improve not, the Bible not in five if, minutes. Not if, not, if the Bi not if the Bible was written thousands of years ago, no. No, but that, that if would it suggest was written, it's divine if it was written, No, because you have to have, a, the idea is, can you create a book? which an interpretive community for thousands of years mm -hmm. would find nourishment and meaning in. And, and I know that you think that's easy, but I suspect it's more difficult than you think. Well, the bar is set just a little bit we'll higher see how long than the end managed in Leviticus. We'll see how long the end of faith lasts. Okay. I don't know. Question over here. Um, this question is for both of us. It actually touches a little bit on what was just said. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, although uh, you were talking earlier about healthy and unhealthy religions, and in that context, I'm assuming you were, I mean, uh, fanaticism, and in more context, uh, Islamic fanat fanaticism. Not just. Uh, not just, but, but primarily. Uh, primarily, yes. and specifically. Um, and although there are very few Jews today who are uh, stoning <laughs> their children to death, uh, there are still is Islamic. There are Jews who are There are still Muslims who are killing, people, uh, killing infidels. Um, and I'm just wondering what allows us, and this has to do with more of the, the moderate religions, what allows us to even consider 
reform Judaism or lesser forms of Christianity, Christianity or Judaism together, wh why do we not consider these completely different religions? What allows completely, us... Completely, I'm sorry? Different religions. Why, um, why are we... Um, why, why are they not se separated? Why are they still... Completely different from Islam or completely different from other forms of Judaism? Uh, other forms of Judaism. Other, if there are still people today, I'm sure this isn't very well produced. No, that's okay. I, I just wanted to be clear. For, for Jews, it's a slightly different question than for Christians because Judaism is a, is a nation as well as a religion. So it's not purely a function of belief, it's also a function of community. For a Christian, you might, I mean, look, for a long time, Protestants and Catholics essentially felt that they belonged to different religions, despite the fact that we would see them as the same. I don't know exactly what the breaking point is, but I suspect that it's less doctrinal than it is organic. That is, at a certain point, like the Karaites, they just sort of stepped outside of what was the mainstream of Judaism and then disappeared. Whether that will happen to Reform, Conservative, or Orthodox, Judaism, time will tell, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, we have a question over here. Yeah, Rabbi Wolpe, you pointed out that um, people with religious faith have been found to be happier, more content. Um, isn't it possible that that's just because they have found an answer, they've found answers to the most anxiety-producing questions that humans have about where we come from and where we're going after we die. Whether or not those answers are true, yes, they entirely feel possible. Yep. they have been relieved of that anxiety and are therefore entirely happy. And I'd possible. like Mr. Harris's comment on that too, please. Well, I should have added this uh, when you brought it up. It, that literature is a mess, and there, there are obvious confounds in many of those studies. For instance, religion is very good at building community, and we know that having lots of friends and loved ones around uh, is, is very important for, for people's sense of well-being, and the, the, the variable of community has not been teased out in many of those studies. There's also the example of societies in Western Europe, like Sweden, where uh, by every marker of the health of a society, they're healthier than our own. I mean, for educational markers, uh, markers of, of you know, violence and and um, uh, uh, theft. I mean, they have the, not. I shouldn't have said every marker. There's. I heard alcohol coming from the audience. Yeah. Um, so, okay. But but the thing to notice is that that even in, in the most atheistic society on the planet, which is Sweden, the level of generosity. I mean, the, the, really, like, kind of Christian. The Christian virtue of gen generosity, both within the society and to the developing world is is much higher than it is in our in our in our culture so it's it's not that the, the, this can be read both ways and there's a, and much research is yet to be done on the actual effect of religion on the society I have a lot more to say about it but yeah, actually but I, mean, I know that just, there are questions say, waiting so just say, it's been it's been a long night let's just take a few more questions and I think we may call Mimi I uh, guess sir Rabbi, in your introduction, uh, there was a comment about uh, when you were a teenager, you um, shifted your perspective to a more spiritual path. And um, I'm curious, uh, what was that shift? And I asked the same question to Mr. Harris. Um, when you were growing up, was there any kind of religious background? And did you have a turning point in your life where you made a more scientific approach to philosophy? Hmm. Oh, from uh, this is a slightly long story, so I'm going to very much abbreviate. It was a yeah. it was a long it was a long process for me. It wasn't a single experience, um, and a lot of it had to do with my understanding that religion wasn't the crutch for weak people that I automatically assumed it was when I was an adolescent, and that in fact it reflected often a profounder understanding of life, um, and. Uh, and I would say there's almost, there's almost um, an ironic flippancy and defensiveness about being a teenager that makes it more difficult to understand what I would, what I would call the deeper levels of living. Mm -hmm. Was there a turning point for you, sir? Uh, there, was, there was no turning point. In terms of my, I had an interest in religion from a very early age and in religious experience, but I never was religious. I never, I never was brought up in a religious tradition to which I'm now reacting. Um, and uh, but the, the moment I, I really started thinking about the liabilities of religious belief came after 9-11. I mean, that was 
Oh, you, you, and then that's that's it. Yes, sir. It's particularly for Mr. Harris. Mm -hmm. um, there have been many scientists um, who've been religious people, mm -hmm. and many religious people who've also been scientific. Why why can't the two coexist? For example, one thing I've always remembered uh, that I studied in college, Blaise Pascal um, had his famous wager, right. since you can't prove the existence of God nor disprove the existence of God, I'm better off acting in my life as if it's true that God exists. Right. And I was right. wondering if you could comment on, on those things. Yeah, uh, well, I think the best way to address the, the compatibility of science and, and religion is in the person of Francis Collins. I don't know if you know him. He ran the Human Genome Project for the U.S. He's a, um, a medical geneticist, uh, obviously a scientist with a great career in science, and he's also an evangelical Christian. Uh, and he's written a book entitled The Language of God where he claims to square his evangelical Christianity with the last 50 years of molecular biology and argue successfully that, that God exists. We know this based on scientific principles and um, Jesus is his son. Uh, now, I can't say that he's not a scientist, but what I can say is that the, the place in his book where he tells you when his doubts were re truly removed, the, the, his conversion experience, um, is uh, testifies to the to the the way the human mind can be partitioned, where where a scientist can 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 lapse in the most egregious way in in terms of his scientific standards. And the, because the passage goes like this: I was hiking in the Cascade Mountains and came upon a beautiful frozen waterfall. Uh, and my doubts were removed, and I fell to my knees in the dewy grass and surrendered myself to Christ. Uh, it's virtually verbatim. Uh, so now I would suggest to you that it should be obvious to all of you, and it certainly should have been obvious to Francis Collins, that if a frozen waterfall can testify to the divinity of Jesus, anything can mean anything. Um, he said he, he actually elaborated on this point in an interview for Time magazine. He said the waterfall was frozen in, in three streams, and this put him in the mind of the Trinity. Uh, okay, this is, this is psychotic thinking in any other context. You know what about that? that no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Is that maybe that's the point? Well, of course, it's exactly the point. When you apply the wrong category to the wrong experience, it seems ludicrous. What he was saying is, I had a religious experience. Read the first chapter of Ezekiel. You'll see it in an even a more extreme form. A religious experience, if you're outside of it and you evaluate it, of course, it, so does a poetic experience. I could say to you, shall I compare you to a summer's day? And you'll say, that's an idiotic thing to say. I'm not a summer's day. Well, of course you're not. And yet, there is a truth in meta not Not you, you are. but uh, uh, And yet, there is a truth in metaphor and in imagery. And what seems to me significant, and by the way, I've read Collins book and I think it's a pretty good book um, what is significant is here's a guy who was trained in science who evaluates things scientifically and recognizes intuitively as not everyone does that his experience of religion is not to be evaluated scientifically you think that that's a failing in him I think that that is a measure of the largeness of the man's soul well it's clearly a failing in that he goes on to make explicit claims about the divinity of Jesus his resurrection the likelihood of his return to earth in but other words in other words it's having had an experience of God, he believes the tradition in which other people who've had experiences of God have taught him, we've come here, but it's like what people said about Plato. Whatever road of life you walk down, you found him on the way back. That's what he experienced in his faith. Okay, last question here. Okay, Rabbi, do you think that Western religion in particular, and especially as far as science is concerned, the problem is anthropomorphic imagery of God and all the stories that we tell that, of course, you know, are f appear to be, right. uh, you know, un, you know, just unfathomable. Right. The rabbis say that the Torah speaks in the language of human beings because they recognized exactly that problem. When you seek to express that which is not human, first of all, we're limited by our conceptual apparatus, right? I mean, how do you imagine? It's like when you read science fiction. So the creature has three heads, right? We can't really imagine something that is other than ourselves. And this is what I would say sort of as a... As a 
I say to um, students, when you're five years old, you can't imagine what a 20-year-old is. It's far beyond your conception. Now, we are, in terms of God, far less capable of understanding God than a five-year-old is of a 20-year-old. So we use very elementary images to explain something that is infinitely greater than ourselves. The only time it sounds silly is when you think you have to put God on a conceptual grid. When you say, well, obviously, there's no God, because I like Yuri Gregarin, the cosmonaut said, I was up there in space, and I didn't see him. Right? Yeah. So all I can so, tell you is, if that's your measure, you'll never see him. Yeah. So now, let me... Uh, If, uh, if I were in my newsroom uh, at the L.A. Times, uh, they would say that I busted deadline. But, uh, but we've had a lot of fun here tonight. Uh, guys, I'll ask you to make any just final remarks in just a second. First, a few thanks. Uh, thank you um, to the university for organizing this event. And, uh, Thank, thank you for, for those who asked questions, and you're a very polite and wonderful audience. And thank you for inviting me to the picnic. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, so uh, any la oh, and just, don't forget, folks, uh, books are out there in the lobby. Any last thoughts, gentlemen, you want to share? Oh, I go first. Uh, the, I will just, really just a continuation of what I said, which is that the, you know, the, the, the Bible says that the beginning of wisdom is uh, reverence for God, and I would say that the beginning of wisdom, rather than, let's say, reverence for God, the beginning of wisdom is the assumption and the belief that it could be possible that things exist in this world which human beings cannot measure, to which they do not have access, except by something that is transcendent inside of us. Just as our limbs have limitations and we can't fly, um, our minds have limitations too. But the fact that we don't understand something greater than ourselves doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Yeah, Mr. Harris. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would say that the place to put our faith is in human conversation. This is all we have to work with. And the choice is to have a, a truly modern 21st century conversation, availing ourselves of all of the tools and um, all of the wealth of human effort uh, that is our legacy. Uh, or we can fixate our conversation in a prior century. It can be the 7th century if you're...